congratulations on the film. It's an absolutely fantastic film. I've actually already watched it twice, so congratulations. Oh, really? That's awesome, mate. Thank you so much for that. I mean, you don't have to say that. Um, <laughs> and, mate, for me, you know, from my perspective, like, I know it's sort of designed for a specific type of audience, you know what I mean? Um, people who sort of really enjoy that sort of revenge style, um, you know, activity. And, you know, it's, it's not going to... It's not going to be, you know, sitting up there trying to do too much. It just is what it is. It's just basic hangover watching or, you know, sit there watching films. It's not going to... It's not a masterpiece, but I just hope people enjoy it. Yeah. So where did the idea come about for you in the first place? Well, mate, I wrote a book um, in 2016. 2015, 2016, so... Um, and I started, you know, I'd always had this basic concept and I just sort of started to expand it out and, you know, the story changed a little bit as I was writing the book and, um, you know, eventually it just sort of came together as what it was and, and even when we were making the film because we had limited funds, we um, we had to change the story a little bit towards the end, like it's about maybe um, a quarter of the story missing from the book. Yep. Um, and... Yeah, it's just, you know, there's a little bit of each character, I'd say, comes from Earth, a little bit. Yep. I I know a lot of people out there who listen to this show are actually uh, writers, so how difficult was it for you to adapt it from the book? Um, well, we had to follow some basic rules, which the first one was driven by economics. Um, we had to make sure that we could afford to make the film for $400,000, which is not a lot. Yep. Um, and, you know, I had always had the characters in business, but, you know, the fact is, I did the casting for the film as well, and what ended up happening, mate, is we had 10,000 teen actors applied for the ensemble in America. 10, oh, wow. 000. Yeah, so we had to, I had to stop it at that. It took over three months just to go through the initial reviews of everybody. And then when the characters appeared, they weren't exactly how they were in the book, so I had to sort of make a hybrid between the actor and the character, yep. uh, rather than sort of try to run hard and fast rules. So we had to make a framework, but, you know, putting together stuff like locations when you can only afford so much, you, you dictate a terms, and you have to spend time are trying to find the best beach house you can find when they're going for three and five thousand dollars US a night. Yep. You know, um, so like the actual story itself was impossible to contain in the first movie because it's an origin story. So if you if you watch, you know, any of the X Men, you know who they are. I mean, you know who Thor is. They don't have to spend hours trying to have you invest in Thor because you know he's a good you know who he is you know everybody knows who Batman is I had to try and create these characters who were you know damaged teens and get people to you know in a way invest in the character because without an emotional attachment to any of the teens the story you know won't run as well yep yeah so it was very difficult to contain the book in the movie and I couldn't in fact probably there's another 40 minutes of movie missing from it. Yep, yep. So for those people out there who are interested in watching the film, tell us a little bit about your film background. How did, um, did you do any official training on being a filmmaker or how did you go about learning the skills to actually get to the point of making the film? Okay, um, interesting question. I, I had, I had the idea that initially to write a screenplay before the book. My sister lives in America. She'd shown it to a very successful Australian screenwriter who'd read it as a favour. He said to me, mate, you know, this thing's a dog's breakfast. It's way too long, you know, but it's a really good story. So, you know, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, oh, I'm just going to send it out to production companies. He's like, no, no, don't do that. They just, they'll just steal it. And, you know, as I spent more time in the industry myself, I realised they actually do do that. They produce a dude still. And I've met people who have actually, that's their job, is to take people's ideas and change them a little bit. Um, so I ended up having to write the book, took time off for that. But then the screenplay also improved from the book. And, you know, I started actually trying to um, make it in Australia. And I tried.
try to get Screen Australia to help us. And Screen Australia, because I was an untested, unproven um, producer and director, said, nah, it's not going to happen. And I said, well, hang about. I've gone out and got over a million dollars in funding to make this film in Australia. People love the story. We had 3,000 actors apply for it in Australia. Um, can you just at least read the script? And they're like, nah. I was like, you've got to be serious. You're surely going to read the script. They're like, nah. Yeah. So what had happened is I'd gone to America to do the edit of the, the, the US edit for the book because we were going to release it to the US market. And at, when I was over there, I just spoke to a few producers and just to sort of gauge interest. And um, one of them was a $10 million New York-based uh, producer. And he thought, mate, I love the story. You know, we want to... We want to get involved in it. And it was great. They were sort of putting the pieces together for me. Um, and then at the end, they're like, look, we probably, we know what we're doing. You know, we've worked with the likes of Jennifer Miller. We worked with all these big actors. Um, let us do the story. Let us just buy the story from you as a script. And I was like, nah. I mean, they offered me 100000 for it. And I yep. was like, nah, nah. I want to be involved in this. I spent too many years getting to this point. So, mate, what I had to do was put myself into a three, I think it was like a, not three months, it was something like a six-week um, director's, producer's course at um, Actors, which is a great film school. Um, and effectively, they just skimmed over everything for me um, and, you know, gave me some of the tools and I guess maybe some of the sort of research and the documents I needed to try and put it together. Um, and, you know, when I... Went back to Screen New South Wales, Screen Australia, and I said, guys, look, I've got interest from America. Can we please do this? I've got a, at the time, I had an Australian producer on board, a female from down Canberra. She was keen as much, but I was starting to build the crew. I had half of the cast set. And they're like, no, we won't read it. I'm like, guys, I've got these investors. They won't invest in Australia unless we can reduce the risk. And I asked for about $120,000 as a grant. Um, you know, from an agency that gives four or five million dollars away, yep. you know, in lump sums, and they just refuse to read the read the script to, to look at the whole package and said no. So, mate, what ended up happening was, with no choice to make it here locally, because I couldn't convince the investors to run it off a dollar investment when the industry returns less than thirty cents. Um, you know, I. I spoke to the New York governor's office and they're like, yeah, mate, we'll, we'll back you. We'll, um, we'll give you a 35% rebate. Um, I spoke to the American government. They're like, you know, you can't just come over here and make a film. You know, we've never had somebody do this. The only visa you would apply for is an E2 and you're not qualified for it because we don't get a film and ongoing business. Um, and, you know, I went over there, spent time in America convincing them that this is a ongoing business as a um, franchise and the production company will keep making other films and in the end I ended up becoming the first person to ever get an E2 visa to make a film in America. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and then I just had to hit New York, mate, with no contact, um, $400,000 um, and, you know, thankfully my sister had lent me her apartment to stay at and I... You know, over the period of nine months, I built a production team from scratch, um, pretty much relying on my previous um, business experience. I used to be in insurance and I'd run underwriting agencies that I'd own, so I'd built them and sold those in the past. And, mate, if you can run a small business, you can make a film. It's that simple. Yep, yep. So, ironically... Even though Screen Australia didn't get behind the film, you ended up being nominated for um, an actor award for best indie film. How did that feel when that a nomination got read out for you? Well, mate, I um, the the problem with Australia is the um, the agencies and the the systems they're all they're all actually connected. Um, so to me. I've got a little bit of a problem that I would probably like to um, have the Australian public become aware of. I think I think people need to know what happened yep. um, with me and to avoid it happening again. Yep. Um, but, mate, the problem with that is Screen Australia is in everything. These 
same people control the advertising for every screen publication. They control AAASPTA. Yeah. They, they control uh, Melbourne International Film Festival. When I say control, I mean they give so many hundreds of thousands to all these bodies. I mean, Channel 9 is not going to run a show on Screen Australia because Screen Australia literally gives millions of Australian taxpayer dollars to Channel 9. They're not going to put that at jeopardy. Yep. Nobody is. Yep. And my, my situation is actually, you know, to the point where I, I, I'm almost ready to accuse them of not only refusing to do their job in the first instance, but actually, mate, in a way, sabotaging yep. um, the project, um, which is something I will, I said, mention to the media down the track. But, mate, for the hope of positive improvement, Australian film industry needs help. Yep. The returns are diabolical. So if you're an Australian producer, you're facing, you're looking down the barrel of an average industry return of under 30 cents in the dollar. Yep. Now, you can get 38 cents back by making your film in Australia, qualifying it for Quake, um, which is the Qualified Australian Production Expenses. So that gives you down at 62 cents. Now, you have to beat the average by a lot to get yep. that return that you need. Um, other words, you're literally just burning money. Now, Screen Australia has a function to perform there to lessen the risk. Um, and that's an important function. But, my goodness, when they're playing God and running little boys club um, for their friends, uh, it just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. They keep producing the same crap that nobody wants to see. Yeah. Rather than, you know, building stories that, you know, I sort of... I, said to them, I said, God, this is like, I'm trying to make an international story, international appealing story. I'm trying to build a franchise so we're not just stuck being flooded with the twilight and all this sort of stuff. Help me make this something that we can send out to the world. Yep. You know, and could, could you imagine the business that could have come from that? Had we been successful, we have a three or four films. And, you know, actually, rather than just sort of taking all the American dominance here, actually sort of just, just, and only a little bit, but just penetrating over there and just having their sense go, oh, I love this story. Do you know what I mean? Yep. I'm not, you, you wouldn't need Australianisms in there, do you know what I mean? This this was shot in New York, but could have just as easily been shot in Sydney with the exact same story. Yep. Uh, to- right? You- Sorry, yeah, I was going to say, bringing it back to the film and filming it in New York, what was that like? filming in New York, and you mentioned earlier about the cast and having so many people apply. How did you actually go about choosing the right cast as well? Okay, well, the casting took a long time. Um, You know, we went from, I went from 10,000 down to 3,000 by just really looking at a minute, 90 seconds, or two minute reels. You know, people didn't have reels that were ready to rock and roll. You know, you were just initially, they're out. You know, unless there was some extreme reason why they should be reconsidered. So you're just sort of filtering down, filtering down, filtering down. Um, and then what actually happened was three groups started to emerge. So with inside, you know, the seven in the ensemble and inside that ensemble of seven kids was the initial uh, minimum age was 16 for the application, but actors being actors and cheeky, you know, 14 and 15 year olds applied for it. Um, so we, what we ended up with is sort of, you know, your average 18 to 20 year old, 18 looking person. And then we had the sort of younger kids who, you know, could have potentially created sort of more volatile um, characters and, you know, bigger arcs with these kids are so young looking but doing these things. Um, and then you had the sort of the 90210 people who are, hey, you know, I'm a teenager, but they're really, you know, buying their first house and yeah. <laughs> family so um what ended up happening was it came down to the battle of the danny and then once that got set and the the middle age sat in then really the the older and the younger ones no longer fit in as uh candidates because you know there's sort of interreactions there's physical uh disagreement there's uh, and, 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 and the potential love interest there and you have to make sure that they look like they're the right ages Yep. Um, and mate, we didn't have the budget to run, you know, turn 28-year-olds into 18-year-olds or turn 15-year-olds into 18-year-olds with makeup and that sort of stuff. So, 
Um, we kept them within a few years of each other, and they're all in the sort of 18 to very low 20 range. Um, so, yeah, that helped a lot once we sort of got that done. Um, mate, in regards to New York, it was absolutely amazing. It's such a beautiful city. The backdrops there are just unbelievable. I mean, you know, you can film in Central Park, and it's a very film-friendly city. They will let you turn up with cameras. You can't put tripods down, but you can just film there. You can film, you know, in any Times Square. You can take a camera into there and film. Um, you know, we were lucky that, you know, in respect of us, we were a low-budget film, so people who are in the background, as long as you can't see them, um, they aren't background actors. They're people in Central Park. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, but it looks great, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, what happens sort of to the edge of the camera and behind the camera, you know, everything's falling apart, but, you know, you get everything right in front of the camera and, and it looks like your production's worth millions of dollars and it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, where to now for the franchise for you? Like I said, this is a great film and you mentioned that there's a franchise idea there. So, where to now for this franchise? Well, um... The film itself has to make more of a financial return, um, which is difficult because, um, like I said, I'm dealing with legacy issues of the Australian situation. And in America, there's very different but um, very similarly difficult problems with independent film distribution in the fact that most distribution agreements, and the film has received, you know, 15 distribution agreements. Um, but, mate, the clauses inside of them are very for lack of a better word, predatory. And, you know, it makes it... Effectively, you give your film to somebody for free and on the promise of them, you know, doing their best to sell it, but inside the agreement are these terms which you would never have heard of or considered, which effectively means... And I'm not talking about my film, I'm talking about speaking to hundreds of producers over there and hearing that they get really 10 cents in the dollar or 20 cents in the dollar of the turnover from the films that they made. So these middle people are sort of scraping out 70 and 80% returns. Um, so I'm trying to navigate that minefield. Um, it's very difficult because the likes of the big companies, so many millions of people in the world want to get a film made, so their doors are flooded with, hey, I've got a great idea. So they close everything down. They batten down the hatches. You can't get in contact with them unless you know people. The only way to deal with them is through these intermediaries. You look at something as simple as, you know, um, Apple, um, Amazon. Some of them have these uh, blockages where you can't actually get your product on there unless you go through these intermediaries. Yep. So they're like gatekeepers. And they say, oh, look, you have to deal with these gatekeepers, but the way the gatekeepers work is they're like, well, if you want to deal with us to get onto Apple, you've got to give us your film. Yep. They're like, no, mate, I just want to use you to get on Apple. I'm like, no, nah, that's not how it works. Yep. So there's a, there's a little bit of a rebellion going on over in, um, you know, Los Angeles would be the epicenter of it, um, where independent filmmakers are trying to sort of group together and there's some potential civil cases going on against the likes of these third-party enforced agreements. Um, and I'm sort of stuck in the middle trying to make money, you know, so we're, we're trying to, you know, we, we went to the cinema, we got, we opened in, um, you know, Los Angeles' most uh, prestigious cinema, the Chinese Man Theatre Complex, you know, above the handprints of Marilyn and uh, Thor, his handprints are in there as well. Um, so, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great time and we, we competed against Parasite, against Bad Boys 3. Um, Birds of Prey and, and Sonic and you know we did enough to be held over the next week and one of those films I can't remember which one dropped out and we stayed yep. you know so we have done enough in the numbers that the kids were coming in and go oh I love this film you know like, yeah we're, we're getting it out and getting the message out it cost millions of dollars in America and we were sort of stuck you know on such a sort of limited market within 20 miles of cinema you know and we had the plan to West to East Coast tour, all, all ready to rock and roll, all, all pretty much all finalised, but, um, you know, then COVID hit, and all of a sudden, we're out of cinemas, we'll never be in cinemas again, because the fact is, when the cinemas finally do reopen, all the spaces go to the big, understandably, go to the big films. I mean, yep. they're the people who provide the bed and brother for all the cinemas. 
players and the cinemas themselves are going to be in a financial situation. They're not going to be taking risks on independent film. It's going to be a difficult time for independent film. I, you know, for me, and getting the franchise through to the second one, I have the ageing problem. I have to get this film made in the next year or two to keep the same cast. Otherwise, we're going to be back looking Beverly Hills 90210. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to balance out holding on to the film as much as I can to get enough money just in case we have to physically pay for the second film ourselves. But also battling against, well, maybe we should just give to these people and get absolutely pirated by them, and then at least more people will have seen it, and then maybe Hollywood money will come in for the second one. Because the second one's going to be a lot more expensive to make, minimum a million dollars before you're adding in celebrity. We'd be hoping that teenagers would love it so much that it would catch on a bit wildfire, um, you know, sort of a sort of Instagram advertising campaigns and the like. Um, and hope that some, you know, celebrities would come along and say, hey, I want to be in the second one. Definitely. Uh, uh, you know, which would be great, because we have some characters that we could come in and make the second one all done, the story's done in bullet form, and you should see the second story, like, it's, it's even better than the first <laughs> one. You know, they take on Big Pharma and religion. Yeah. Two things, two very taboo things to take on and make these kids, what they do to them, <laughs> that's brilliant. Awesome. Well, mate, we cannot wait to be able to see the second one. And we know that the people here in Australia can't wait to see the first one as well. So we're hoping that all our listeners out there can get behind you and help get this uh, released in Australia somehow as well. Yeah, thanks, Dave, mate. I really, really appreciate it. I really do hope that the Australian teens love it. Like, all the teens we've seen in America say, oh, I love it, I love it. You know, the people who like films like Driving Miss Daisy and who want to be critical of, you know, little components of films, they're going to be like, that was crap. <laughs> I'm like, you're the wrong person, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, yeah, we hope the teenagers do love it. We really do. We hope that they, you know, they, they, they see back similar, where they, you know, they come to me and say, oh, I love this character and his line. They're like, oh, that's great, you know. And in America, one of the things that was really great is, you know, it's a very ethnically diverse cast. Yep. And, you know, they just, teenagers who look like the teenagers but don't get to see themselves in films all the time. You know, dealing with the issues that they deal with. So, you know, that's when people sort of hit on that spot and they come back and say, I loved it because of that. Yep. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, mate, like I said, we hope all our listeners do get behind you because we need to see this film in Australia soon. 